Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my immense pleasure to welcome today Dr. Frank Fidzak, who is professor and head of the Deutsche Telekom Chair of Communication Networks at the Technique Universitat of Dresden. Uh, Dr. F Frank Fidzak holds the uh, uh, Telecom Chair of Communication Networks. Uh, he has had uh, several positions. He was adjunct at the University of Ferrara, Italy. He had, uh, he joined after that the uh, University of Alborg, uh, and now he's at Dresden, obviously. He had had v uh, many visiting positions at MIT, uh, Arizona State. He got several awards and uh, we are very happy to have him here talk about tactile internet and human in the loop. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice words. So also a warm welcome from my side, or as you say in this region, moin. So my um, talk is about tactile internet, that's still true. I also brought you some insights about the communication network that we are using for that. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard the term tactile internet. Um, I give you a short introduction into that. Um, there is currently an IEEE subgroup um, working on that, and they gave a definition on that. Um, as you can see, this is uh, the tactile internet. It's a center for tactile internet. This is uh, one of the excellence cluster we have in Germany, and we wrote the um, proposal three years ago. We started with that. The definition was a little, slightly different, but now they have something that goes along our lines, which means it's a network or network of networks for remotely accessing, perceiving, manipulating, or controlling real or virtual objects or process in perceived real time by humans or machines. So this by humans was not there in the beginning. We put therefore in the title with human in the loop. So for us, it was very interesting when we started with 5G, how communication machine type um, would work machine to machine, but what is if the human is in the loop, right? And um, there are some very nice aspects of that. So when you talk about the tactile internet, um, you start with the internet, right? The internet wanted to democratize information so that you can get access worldwide wherever you are. No limitation, whatever, you get information. The tactile internet is more, oops, the tactile internet is more or less the same, only that we want to democratize skills and expertise of humans. So if you know somebody who's really good in something, right, maybe cooking, playing piano, why not preserving this skills and expertise, doing it in a life or in a um, reserved um, skill set, and then get it um, access to that on a global scale. And this was to promote equity for people of different gender, ages, cultural backgrounds. So skills that you never had, or even skills that you lost, because you got older, or you got an accident, whatever. So this is the main idea behind it. In order to transfer a skill from a human to a human, there are some learning aspects. We have this in the center as well. Therefore, we have psychology people there, but even from machine to machine, but also from machine to, uh, from, from human to machine. And this is maybe the most obvious transfer skill that we found, right? So on the left, you have one um, expert, the blue thing around it, it's the skill, and you want to bring it to the robot, right? The easiest you, you can do is you just give him an Xbox controller. Nowadays, some of the young people would know what an Xbox controller is. The old people, especially those of the skills we are interested in, would not know what an Xbox controller is, right? The other thing what you could do is you could make the controller a little bit smarter. We did this some years, um, I think two and a half years before. This is the CEO of Deutsche Telekom. And he has some sensors, two in the hands, some in the jackets, some in the glasses. And whenever he moves, our humanite Mr. T is also moving, right? So think about remote operation or whatsoever. Um, in this case, it's just another controller. The problem with a controller is not only how to use it, it's scalability. So if you have one expert, how many times can you really use this skill? Now, in order to beat the scalability, what you do is you take an expert, and then you know in industry, for example, car manufacturers, they do it that way. You get a computer scientist, and then the scientist and the expert they talk, then he's doing the software, and then you bring it to the robot. 
So scalability is not a problem here, because once you have the skill set, you can repeat it many times. The problem now are different. First of all, this takes a long time, not days or weeks, sometimes months, until you have the skill on the robot. The other thing is the cost of the programmer is two to six times higher than the robot itself for car manufacturers. Nowadays, the price of the robots is dropping, so the price of the programmer in the ratio will go up again. So the problem is now, if you talk about industry 4.0, that instead of making millions of copies and we make smaller lot sizes, I think the, the price ratio between the programmer and the robot is not a good ratio. We have to beat that. The other thing is, um, we don't find enough of these programmers. So programming is easy, but programming robots is not that easy. And even from a technical university, we don't have enough people that the industry would require right now. And the biggest threat is, of course, expert talking to computer scientists. They don't like to talk. So coming back to the idea, what this CEO showed you, right? He was moving, the robot was moving. So in case we, we get some intelligent closing with a lot of sensors, and the sensors are moving with the expert, then you could bring every movement of the um, human directly to the robot arm as we did before. But this time, actually, we are not even moving it. We just want to learn. And with machine learning, we are producing the software now automatically. So we are kicking out the computer scientist. Not fully because we need him to build this system, but he's out of, the, of this food chain, right? Some of the computer science people don't like that. Um, but I think if you really want to democratize programming robots, that's the only way you do it. Let the expert do the job and learn from the expert. So our idea is we train this multiple times, and then we know what to do, right? And at the same time, we did the excellence cluster. We started with a group building this Mr. T that you saw. Um, we also thought, why don't we start a startup right away? The idea is good. Why don't we sell this jacket or something, the jacket and the program? We did not know it even at, at that time. And um, this a company I was called Wandelbots. Um, they started two years, uh, I think not even two years ago, with two people. They are now around 66 people. And they are building this white jacket. Right? This is um, the CEO of Volkswagen, Dietz. And what he did, he, he just put a loudspeaker from the table and put it into the door of the car. You have to press with a little bit of pressure to get the plastic nibbles to hooked in, but not too much because you would break them. Now, he did this multiple times, and after that, the robot um, really did the job. They selected this use case because they said for this, with KUKA together, they needed nine months. This was minutes, OK? So, it's interesting. The other thing is, in, if you can train a robot, when I talked to Sami, Sami Haradin, who's uh, chair in Munich, we said, in the proposal, you have to write a big number, because we have American reviewers, and they will say, so what will you achieve? And we said, in seven years, we will achieve one million skills with a robot. And when we put it down, I said, it will fire back. Right? In seven years, they will ask us, where are the one million skills? So um, later. So you write the proposal, this happens, and then some, somebody like this young lady shows up, 14 years old. And here you see the sensors. There's no closing, right? We just put basic sensors from movie trackers. And she is training a robot some artificial skills. And in one week, she made 1,000 skills. I just wanted to hire her for the seven years, and then at least I would done. But now you see it's easy to do the job, right? This is now a robot um, that we are using for school classes to teach them how to teach a robot with just the skill set. And they can really try it out. I think that's quite interesting. At this point, you can ask, OK, great. Why do they have an excellence cluster? Right? Everything works. The only thing that does not work is that we do this on the global scale. So far, the expert stands right away next to the robot, and this works. Okay. Also, the other way around is not working and whatsoever. But of course, they are our benchmark. A part of the excellence cluster, but they are also our benchmark. If they run too fast, and we cannot cope up this, and we don't have anything to show, we are doomed. But it's good to have such people on board. What you see now is, what if you have here the expert? And now, the expert has a very cool, skinny um, closing. 
which we are doing right now, right, by our um, Refin Institute, in waving all of these clothes together with some electronics and sensors. And when the, the expert is moving, all these skills by moving will be transported to any robot in the world. Let's say Japan. And if you are standing here and I'm moving, all, to transport all my movements over there is easy. The problem becomes if you need some feedback from there. And feedback, there are three types of feedback. One is visual, one is audio, and the other one is haptic. So audio and video, you may know about it. I thought I know about it. Um, the problem is really the latency, right? You will see it later. And for haptic, we don't know it yet. So this, the big problems are the three skills, if you look at this. And the first thing is, from the, compu from the communication network point of view, how do they differ? And there are two aspects. One is data rate, and the other one is latency, right? And we all know video is big, audio is mediocre. Haptic could be really huge if you don't compress it, right? Nobody knows it's a compressor for these things. You can do it in a very generic way with compressed sensing or have a dedicated algorithm for that. I will talk about this later. The other thing is latency. Therefore, we have psychology people, and they say well, they know about it, right? And they say, look at this. Um, you have something about um, visual, how, um, the percentage of people that are sensitive. Some people are sensitive with 15 milliseconds, some with three milliseconds in audio, and one millisecond in tactile. And you say, with, with whom did you measure this? And they say, with rats. I said, but humans? And I said, no, no, rats and humans are the same. No. <laughs> So now we have a big lab where we do the same with, with humans again, right? It seems it's the same. If you talk to Sennheiser here, uh, very close in Hannover, they have a huge lab, and they know that humans are sensitive for three milliseconds. The, good, the musicians, right? Therefore, it's a percentage, right? Maybe I'm not as good because I'm not a musician. I am, my latency is five milliseconds in audio. But there's also something um, for visual. We thought always visual could be that it's not so sensitive but you are sensitive on the outer space, not so much in this, because the dangerous animals 100,000 years ago came from this side, right? So there is something in this, and tactile is really one millisecond, right? That was interesting. That is also how we started the whole thing. Therefore, it was called tactile internet, right? The one millisecond challenge. You don't have it only for humans, also for machines. I will not go into a difference. There's a nice article about this, and I think we will make the same curve now for humans if you're not happy with the rats. Now, the thing here, what you see is um, an haptic joystick, right? Here you see delay impact on machines. When you're five milliseconds, you already see there's a slight difference between it. So every movement you do, you hear, you can even feel here when it hits the ground, right? What you see with 10 milliseconds, it becomes instable, okay? It's a cyber physical system, and you can calculate this one. It's not always 10 milliseconds, right? can be um, a little bit more. We have thousands of these examples, right? Some of them become instable um, even with 20 milliseconds, other with, with three milliseconds. Depends on the cyber physical system. But humans, the same. So how sensitive we are to delay, we have um, very, um, in the beginning of the 5G lab, we made a very complicated setup where we could delay the senses, the video senses for people. <laughs> and the funny thing is we made a low cost a variant for that. You see it here, it's just a phone with a camera, and we delay it here. And the, the task is to catch the ball, right? And at that time, we just said, okay, the delay we put on, on, the, on the camera is twice LTE. So 40 milliseconds by two, 80 milliseconds, right? And if you have 80 milliseconds, you see, if you want to interact in an artificial world with, with LTE speed, that's not, that was the message, right? But still, people are, somehow sensitive and they would like to have it as good as possible. And if I have a latency even 10 millisecond, 20, I get a little bit dizzy, I get easy dizzy. Young people don't get dizzy so easily, so we are using this for the demonstrators. Good. The other thing, um, problem, if we talk about this latency, is speed of light, obvious. What happens if I'm standing here and want to train a robot in, in Japan? and I think one millisecond is what I need. Yeah, then you said no speed of light is 300 kilometer, is one millisecond. What can we do here? Not so much, right? Um, because pure propagation delay is higher than one millisecond. What we do there are two 
things known from the 90s in the teleoperation. We are building models, right? One very easy and understandable thing is we are creating the model of the robot. So you have this one here, and you just create it with augmented reality. I put it in front of you. And then you have the same as we had with Wandelbots. You just train a virtual augmented reality. Once it's learned, it can go to the other side. One way. Problem is, if this robot interacts with other robots, it does not work. So what we need to do then is to create a model for myself and move it to Japan, which is more complicated. Because, and this is political now correct, not all humans are the same. So it depends whether you are tired or not tired. It depends how old you are. There's a nice curve I'll maybe show you later, also from the psychology people. They will tell you if you're 40, 50, like I am now, close, and you play FIFA 20 now with the students, but they're 22, you have no chance because their latency is way better. Right? The only thing you can beat them is by giving them a malfunction Xbox controller or by training harder. So, that was the one way. What, what is with the other way, right? Do, can we only train machines, or can we also learn something? So here's a robot, right? But don't think about a robot. Could be a cloud, whatever. But can, can we train a human being? So now you see this nice gadget here, the jacket. And we have sensors. We have electronics, everything bendable, everything nice. But to train something, what we need is some actuators. And I hate these exoskeleton things. They don't look cool, right? So I want a jacket and a glove where that can move. And as we invade our own gloves and jacket, we can do that. With some piezo, suddenly the things start to move. Problem at the moment, we are not fast enough to play piano. But for other things, it's quite good. There are other teams that try to work with vibrations. Instead of having a full um, movement, they just give you a hint what to do. And I will tell you later how this works. But if you would have such a jacket, just a glove, then we could have a stored skill and say, you train now something. For example, my favorite example is playing the piano. You just sit there, hang loose, and all the things do automatically. You are sitting there, look to the others. That's me, yes, that's me. So when you do this, then you say, maybe gamification, you say, the first finger is now, you have to do it yourself. And with augmented reality, I even show you where to press. right? And then two fingers. How far can you get, right? It's like Guitar Hero. You know how many good play people we got by Guitar Hero? They never played a guitar, but they're really good with the fingers now. And this, this is also important from the psychology perspective. How will humans learn? And one example there, if you know how small kids go bicycling. When I started that, I had the helping wheels. And I was always bouncing from the left to the right. And I did not care so much, right? And then. I was one of the first that could go without the helping wheel. I was so proud. I felt, I think, every five meters. But the thing is, nowadays, you don't see the helping wheels anymore. Because the learning how to go with a bicycle has changed. Because they give the kids first a bicycle without pedaling. Just train the balance. And when they can do it, they give them a bicycle, and then they pedal. So you separate the thing. And if you know how to integrate a function of x and y, you know it's hard, but if you know it's a multiplication of f from x multiplied f from y that's mathematically the same. It's called separation, right? So there is something how we learn. The psychology people have to explain us how we learn. And then with the help of this jacket, we can do some nice tricks. And it's not only for learning. You can even use it for, for uh, rehabilitation. Think about an uh, older guy with a dislocated shoulder. Normally, you have to go um, to, to therapy. And the therapy you get once per day or every second day. And everybody knows eight times per day would be good. So if it's really hard, you are in the hospital. But why not just calling your doctor? The doctor will say, OK, let me get on my jacket. Right? And also the patient takes on the jacket, and the doctor does this. And also the patient does this. And if it does not hurt, the doctor will hang up and say, do this 100 times with your jacket. And then you call again and again and again. And this helps. Right? There are some things from the medical we are trying to embrace there. But there are other things you can do for sport, right? How to row, climbing. We have now one nice belt for dancers, skilled dancers, but they don't know the choreography in the theater. And they just go on the, they look what the others do, and the belt will tell them left, right, front. 
It's such a help. It's just a small reminder, right? But for the dancers, it worked out. Very simplified way of doing the jacket, but it's just on vibration and on clicks. Good. Last but not least, in the end, what we want to do is not only in one direction. We want humans interacting with robots at the same time. So think of a Industry 4.0 fabric where all the robots are moving around, you are moving around, and you interact with them. Okay? And with that, I think um, there's a lot of for research. I will tell you a little bit about that. Business-wise, this is quite interesting because now you can bring back business that we lost to Asia where they have big robotic things. If you have smaller lot sizes, you can even do it in the backyard here now. And for society, there's something in the way how we learn. So you know the boring situation in schools. We can clean this up and make something nicer. For the working space, it will make a big change. And also for the elderly, right? How you will live in your own home together with robotics. Good. This is more or less the, oops, this is more or less the, um, the base idea of our center. I just explain you now how it works, right? This is just the vision. Now, and what we did is we said we would like to have three use cases. In the beginning, we had even more, but we tailored it down to, to three use cases, and you see it on the top. It's the top floor of our pyramid where, say, medicine, industry 4.0, and the learning part. So these use cases will define requirements, what they need to do that. So, for example, we need the jacket, the glove, augmented PI, the way how we learn, co-adaptation. But we also need to communicate the jacket wirelessly over longer distance, here are the intelligent networks, and then there are some, what I said before, the haptic codes, right? That will be crucial to understand how do we get all the information out of these jackets and bring it um, to, with the jacket to the use case, so to speak. But in order to make the second floor, which we call the key enablers, um, you have the basic room, the basic research, or the talent pools that are feeding the key um, rooms. And here you see the humans, sensor and actuators, together with the flexible electronics, communication, information theory, and the tactile computing. And this house somehow shows you we have really homogeneous researchers down here, but the higher you go in the floors, the more interdisciplinary you become. And this is also the task to make, to get a speech between medicine people, psychology, uh, electrical engineering, and also um, computer science. Good, and what happens in the rooms um, as I said, these are the use cases. Um, I think you know more or less what will happen there. Um, here in the K2, in the intelligent networks, I will come back to this. We are talking about networks, body area network type, local area network, and wide area network type. So we have now, because we have partners uh, to Munich and, and we are at TU Dresden, we have now from Deutsche Telekom a uh, fiber network between our two cities with different multi-pass op options totally SDN and FV enabled, and we can test this out about latency, what happens if we are a little bit far away, 500 kilometers more or less. And also how to integrate the sensors into this, this kind of networks. Down here, the humans, I said to you, the, the graph of the rats is, is needed for humans, um, understanding um, how really the, things like getting older impacts your latency issues is important. <coughs> Here you see the, this famous curve about the performance over age, right? So don't be sorry when you lose in FIFA. What happens in the brain of people of different ages? And sometimes they look even culture, right? To say, hey, this is important. This is not important, also important. Some facts about this. Um, here we do um, in TP2 sensors and actuators. Um, we really think about how to make this glove in waving that. We have one institute. They, um, where we're invading um, things like stones and steel and whatever. And we ask them, can you also do the electronics? Not an issue. And we create our own fashion now, so to speak. Um, here you see one of the gloves. Here you see the sensors. And the question is, how many of these sensors do you need? Currently, we have very um, a lot of sensors down here to understand for which use case will we use which information. Sometimes you only need five sensors on the fingers. Sometimes you need more than that. Good. And um, here I will talk about this, um, how we deal with this dilemma that you have throughput delay and um, resilience. How can you bring this together? 
and, and I will not show you this. Ah, next one. Then uh, here we talk about um, how to get the sensors and actuators together in a hub with bendable electronics. When I speak about bendable, it's really that you can really stretch them, bend them. You will, they are so soft you will not even feel them, right? There's no, we also have other things now where we have a glove with sensoric, but we have still a PCB on top of it because there are different groups doing that, right? When you see some pictures about this today. Okay, tactile computing um, is uh, something also clear. What is interesting, we started this um, 1st of January. Currently, we have other activities going on on CT. So CT inspired a lot of new things. Um, we got an Else Kröner Fresenius um, grant, 50 million for the medicine people. They just do co robotics and care, right? Um, Wandelbots is helping us down here. We have also the Schaufler Foundation where we um, get nine PhD for 10 years or the other way around, um, thinking about ethics and um, AI. So then something that we need down here, we also created a center um, for explainable and efficient AI in Dresden in February. So now we are, for all of the rooms, we have dedicated activities that are supporting us, right? It's not that we lack money, but in order to get stronger, I think it's very important to get this kind of support activities. Some side effects, right? Um, we have five disciplines, right? 20% um, female PIs we had. This will be the benchmark. How many people in seven years will we have more, right? Um, how many nations we have, et cetera, and the mean age index patterns, et cetera, PP. And then some cooperation, as you can see here, cooperation between the PIs, um, nicely driven. But coming to the point of this, they call it equal opportunities. Um, what it, equal opportunities are seven different things, but in what the DFG was looking for, the German research agency was gender. So um, if you get a lot of money, it's easy. You go on campus and say, I only hire women, and then the percentage goes up, right? But this does not help neither women, neither the campus, not even our field. So how do you attract female researchers to come and join and work with you. And it's very hard if you go there as an electrical engineer. It's very hard if you go there as a computer scientist. But if you go as a computer scientist or electrical engineer together with the medicine or the psychology people, it's a little bit easier. So um, we wanted to build this truck with a lab inside where we go to 160 schools we have in Saxony. So this is currently what the plan where we have the lab and we just go there and explain pupils that have to, in Germany, you have to make the, um, the choice with, um, I think with, with 10 to go STEM or not STEM. So what we do is we tell them before, before you make the choice, look at this, could this be, this be something for you? And this was, is the truck in action this summer. Um, it was quite um, impressive. Here you see that we had them for two weeks um, going in Dresden. There were a lot of activities. Um, we, showing also in Dresden, Saxony, a very international team, showing some demonstrators that you see. But what I wanted to show is we had school classes. They lined up one after another, going through the truck and trying to get, they made here the, the robot that you saw before. They got some um, talks. They could test out the glove. And there was something very important for them, um, a selfie robot. So they get a jacket and they can do this, right? and the robot make the picture, so we know how to feed them, right? That is also important. They loved it. They got a, picked, a printout of it, took it home, and I hope they remember it for the rest of their life, right? So put it in somewhere and say, hey, engineering is great. So this is something we have. Um, we really want to engage with the students, and, or pupils in this case, and in order to get material that we can give the teachers, because sometimes we show it for 30 minutes to the pupils if we are on the ground, maybe a whole day, but the teachers will ask us, what can we teach them when you go away, right? So we have first aid kits, say, this you can take or send us over, right? But we have one university next door, uh, university, one uh, school next door, where we really define what the pupils should learn. So we go there, what you should learn in math and physics, biology, right? So we can say, well, and we give them now robots and they can program the robots. We give them the, the programs, what we would like to see and do something with them. And the material we derive there will be open source to the other teachers in Saxony and all everybody else who would like to have it. Good. Now, one of the points that I would like to focus also on is which kind of communication network can really help us to address the things that we are doing here. 
It's not only latency, it's not only the data rate, it's more than that. Think about the models, models of me, models of a ro robot that I would like to bring up and down. So how can we really um, facilitate this? Do we need new technologies or can we live what is out there? And one of the things is this so-called 5G network. And I would like to say some words about this, how we can use it. So 5G, um, if you want me to explain what it is, you know maybe the famous triangle of IMT 2020. I always use my 5G atom where I say the core of every communication network is the use case, right? And, and we have the 5G Lab Germany with um, over 20 professors, 20 industry partners. And when you talk to them, virtual reality, augmented reality, transportation, industry 4.0, drones for transportation of goods, um, healthcare, um, construction, energy grids, then teaching, and also agriculture. These were use cases where people came to us and said, we would like to have this use case. And if you ask them what kind of network they need, they will always say, I need a special network, or I need a special network. In the end, it's not true, they all need the same. Right? They need higher data rate, they need low latency, so 10 gigabit per second, one millisecond latency. They, they will deal with a massive number of sensors in, the, in one cell. If you want to, um, for example, if you have cars on the street, resilience, security will be a big issue. Energy, if you have massive amount of sensors, will be um, one of the issues. And last but not least, most people forget about it, heterogeneity. Because you have so many devices, not only mobile phones, you have uh, energy harvesting sensors without computing things, with a lot of computing, with a lot of co com communication um, facilities, etc. So the heterogeneity will be very important how we define algorithm to make them talk to each other instead of slicing them up in different um, networks. Now, one millisecond, let's say 10 gigabit or the five nines or six nines everybody's asking for in resilience. If you want to have that nowadays, it's not a problem. One millisecond I can give you today, 10 gigabit I can give you today, and the big six nines or five big nines in resilience I can also give you. The problem is to get, get it at the same time. One of them is easy. Not so easy, you would say, maybe when you look only at latency. Um, this is, when we talk about one millisecond, where can you spend your, late, your one millisecond? 40% on the wireless part and 60% on the wired part, my guess. That gives you 10% milli, uh, on the sensor and actuator with the embedded computing. Then you have 10% of the millisecond on the wireless transport, upwards, downwards. And then this leaves you 60% of your millisecond in the wired. So when you give, let's say, 25% of your millisecond to the propagation delay, you have more or less 25 kilometers. And then here you have a virtualized network. So this will be a new network. It's not the stupid network that we have today where we, oh, packet, give it away. Packet, give it away. So it will be a packet. You look at it, you compute on the packet, you filter it, and then you do something. And there you have 35% of the millisecond. And this is not easy. Good. Now, that's the latency alone. If you have latency and throughput, here's the plot we teach to the students in the first year we, they are coming to communication networks. We say, why don't you calculate the um, throughput of different Wi-Fi um, systems, right? Um, you don't have to look at all of them. What you see is their throughput versus the, the packet size, and the bigger the packet size is, the better is the throughput, until you will reach the physical layer um, data rate that they always put on the box that you never see, right? But if you do the same for latency, you see it's contradictionally because the larger you do the packet, the larger is the latency. So you have to find out, if you have only one network, what is now latency and what is throughput by defining the mag, uh, seg segment size. This is true for other systems as well, but just to give you an idea. If you then want to go even latency, throughput, and resilience, then you have something here, throughput over delay. And what you see here is um, a way of stop and wait and selective repeat. What is this? Now when we have a communication link point to point and we are losing packets, we have to recover from the packets for the resilience. So one way is I'm giving you one packet, and if you say yes, you have it, I give you the next. This is stop and wait, right? Or the other one is saying I give you a lot of packets, tell me what you lose, and um, selective repeat will say give me packet number 70. But if you have even then 
There's another way, FEC called, right? You can even have an FEC block code. Everything will be on this line, telling you there's a trade-off between throughput and delay. What we are interested, I will show you later how we do this, is to push it somewhere down in this corner, right? And what we get is a very versatile code that can give you throughput and low delay and also very good um, efficiency on the codebook. And then you can say what you want, really low latency or really high throughput with a little bit of um, delay. Good. Now, in order to reach these things, what you need is some concepts, new concepts. So I showed you LTE, and um, LTE does not work. Therefore, everybody wants a new radio, 5G new radio. There's something with latency. If you design a communication system, you cannot improve the latency later on, or it's quite hard. If you want to increase capacity, that's easy. But the latency, that is quite complicated. Therefore, there will be a new air interface. The way how we connect our massive amount of sensors and devices is not the same way we are doing it now in a centralized way where the access point or the base station will say, I'm the master, you're the slave. A lot of more mesh type, vehicle to vehicle, drone to drone communication, sensor to sensor, very important. And then there's something like multipass, um, which is also important to increase, for example, the throughput or the resilience or the security. There are different approaches how we do multipass. Multipass is very interesting because it was the design goal in the 60s when they did the internet, having multipass. They never could do it because it came at the price of throughput. The idea was just using a repetition code over different passes that is good for resilience but very bad for your capacity. There are other things um, I just want to name here, network slicing and mobile edge cloud um, as um, two examples because they are maybe unique for the upcoming networks. At this one, I will not show you. You will find it on the slides later. Network slicing, just for, to show you, if you have the trade-off and you can either decide for good delay or good um, throughput or good um, resilience, then um, you will always come up with a network that is not optimal. But there is a concept of having a physical network and slice it up in a logical network like slices, right? And these slices can have different um, capabilities in terms of satisfying you for latency or for um, throughput. And we did there something um, with Nokia, uh, I think two years ago. We had here um, cars that went automatically without street lights and humans. So two, you need two networks. These guys are video oriented and they, it's a cyber physical system. So the cars have one millisecond, 70 megabit per second. And here you have 30 milliseconds, 220 uh, megabit per second for the video. The video is the Theo Dresden video. Everything is fine, you have two slices, and then suddenly, accident, right? First thing, humans are coming, making pictures, right? So they want more data rate, right? Um, everything is fine because the accident was not detected yet, but the moment the police and the fire workers are coming in, you also need a spectrum for them. One slice for the police. And uh, of course, they have higher priority. And you cannot just give them something in addition. So you have, this is the physical frequency. Now you give the fire workers and the police this safety slice. They have one millisecond now. And in the, what you see also, they're flying in the drones to get more access points, right? Everything fine. And um, what you see is this one millisecond come at the expense of four milliseconds here. Before that, they were driving nearly 50 kilometer per hour. In this zone, they can only go half of the speed now. And the video quality was degrading. We transcoded it a little bit, okay? So this shows you a very nice way of sh understanding what happens if we have different type of traffic or if we want to change the ratio here, right? Very flexible. The other thing is the so-called mobile edge cloud. Mobile edge cloud means you have computing close by. We said light, speed of light is the problem, so bring the computing next to the device. So this is one, uh, the cars are going all automatically. This we are driving manually. You can see the other cars are reacting by just stopping because they don't know what happens, right? All of these demos, what you see here, they are built in Unity, where you, all the ego shooters are um, programmed with. And um, what we do there is really to try to understand and to under see what the network is doing here. And it's not just the visualization. When you see this network, this is a real network down in our server room. 
right? So it's virtualized, and we can really move this mobile edge cloud from one device to another and see where it works. If you come to us, we have even a small one with Raspberry Pis where there's a small ventilator going on when the mobile cloud is there, right? Yes. Making some wind. So this is quite nice, but um, what you see here is the, the core and the two tiers that are only things that w everybody of you can take the PowerPoint and run. The game changer is what happens here, the technologies. Software-defined radio, network function virtualization, um, software-defined networking, and information-centric networks. So when you see these kinds of technologies, this is open source, and this everything here is software. This is the game changer now. So I come from a world where we had these boxes, 19-inch boxes. You have to pay for them every 10 years. And now, suddenly, software comes up. So there's no more generation. Everything is fine. We can now update every day. We don't have to wait 10 years. And what are these things? Software-defined radio is attacking the air interface, of course. With software, you can change the behavior of the radio. Quite nice. And if you want to try it out, I think 100 bucks like Lime SDR, you can have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, LTE in one thing just by programming it. This is more for the, what the network is doing. SDN and NFV are the main building blocks for network slicing in Mobile Edge Cloud. SDN, in a nutshell, is a centralized way um, chopping off the data plane and the control plane, having one centralized unit, not a logical one, could be a... Uh, not a physical one, could be a logical one, with, which is distributed even to make it more resilient. But there's one controller understanding where the routes should be set. It's not distributed anymore. Okay? Remember the telephone networks? Great networks. That worked. Internet? Nah. And now we're going back to SDN? That works. Because it's centralized. It's very interesting. And if we, in a nutshell, is what you do on your phone, you installing apps, network operators can now install their own apps, so to speak, on the network communication switches or whatever is there. So they can bring up services the moment they need it. Whatever the cloud and the device operators had for a long time, they wanted to have in the network, that comes with NFE. And they, these two together are very powerful to building up the other um, concepts down here. ICN is also a very interesting concept of where the content is. Currently, we think there's a physical place where we get it. The network will tell you where the content is. So no more 404 errors on your web browser. Good. When you have that, you know that makes the life harder for Huawei, Nokia, and Ericsson because the boxes are out of the way. Everything is open source. Okay? Um, network operators can say, we do it ourselves. We can do it here. Or my students can do it and say, hey, let's build something new and sell it. But the real kicker why this is so interesting is the next... Oops. Ah, before I do this, um, one thing for the latency. I told you in the beginning... So something for the 35% of the millisecond. Um, currently, if you, if you look what happens with the latency, um, here's a likelihood of occurrence for the round trip uh, delay if you have a virtualized system. And then you get something like this curve and what happens with your latency. This is the 35% barrier. If you just go in a virtualized environment, local loop, and go back, don't even touch the packet, that's the maximum we can currently do. In order to improve it in that way, we are using some um, service uh, functions chaining in order to speed up the delay. But there's a lot of things we have to do in the virtualized world. If you think about the one millisecond, this is really the, the research that is needed. Not so much on the wireless, where most people think. How the embedded um, software and uh, embedded hardware is um, running, that is, has an impact. But also in our nice idea of uh, virtualization. We need virtualization to build network slices and mobile edge clouds, but there is a danger of latency as well. As I said, the real kicker now is when everything is software, novelty, innovation, that what we do in, in, at the university, the impact on products is not that you go and brag somebody, can you put it in the standard for 10 years? And after 10 years, they might put it in the standard, and they, they might come out a product, and after 20 years, you're already in pension, they come up with the product, right? So, what happens now is you have a good idea. You make this thing happen. You just put it in an NFV container, and you just place it in the network. You try it out. Maybe a network operator gives you a slide to say, hey, you can try it out. In this slide, is yours. show me how it works. And then things like blockchaining, machine learning, network coding, compressed sensing, our research topic, you can put in your bullets there. You can bring easily into the network. 
Yeah. Blockchaining you need if you have distributed SDN controllers. Machine learning you need for several aspects, especially for optimizing SDN um, networks. Network coding and compressed sensing, I will talk about this in a minute just to give you a glimpse of what it is. I just have to check the time. That, okay. Um, so two things I would, would like to, to explain you what happens there. So with this kind of softwareization, we have now the, the chance to get our new stuff into this. Network coding is one of my babies. I love it, and um, I will do everything to get it into the networks. And there are some good things, and I'll tell you why we should put it there. If you're interested, um, I have a whole lecture on network coding there. So what we did for the students, you can look uh, it up there. Network coding, um, in a nutshell, was introduced by saying, hey, by the butterfly example, we have a routing problem. We have one source, two destinations, two packets to send over this kind of network. And if you want to route packets A and B somewhere here, and both destinations would like to have both packets, you will see it's with store and forward, it's, not, it's impossible, right? You can make one destination happy, the other one will only get half of the information. No way around it, really. Then network coding popped up and somebody said, wait a minute, at this point where you make a routing decision, whether A or B should be forwarded, why don't we make a function of A and B? And the function could be that you have the A packet is yellow and the um, B packet is blue. What you do is now to say, if I make a function, that the function could say, I'm green, right? I'm just green. In real terms, it's just an XOR operation on the, the bits. It's not getting bigger or something like this. It's not compressed. You just XOR these two packets and you forward it. And this new function, if you forward this to the destination, they can decode something out of it. Interesting approach. One of the things that's really interesting, it's not end-to-end. -end. So it's not the source that is doing something. Somewhere in the network, somebody says, oh, I have a good idea. Let's do uh, coding here, right? Not end-to-end, -end, first thing. The other thing, what it does, it needs to compute something. So instead of store and forward, we are talking now about compute and forward. When the paper came out, I looked at it and said, bullshit, right? Um, you need to know the topology. The topology changed. You don't know how to build the functions. Nice way, but not really working. And Ralph Kötter at the time said, um, if this work would work randomly, would it work for you? So that would be better. So coming to a random code. Um, normally, when you have a coding, you have normal packets, original packets, and you have coded packets. And you give them over a coding matrix. And a lot of professors gave their name and built up this matrix. Some of them are stupid, some of them are not usable. But you know Reed Solomon, for example, right? Or other matrices that have a name, Hemming, or whatever. You put in some numbers here, and this means how are these packets combined in a linear fashion to get a coded packet. As you can see from the word random, um, it came out, um, out that if you just put random coefficients, they're equally good. There are papers that showed decades before that random codes are a very bad idea. But they were only bad if your dice has only a zero and a one. If your dice has many um, numbers, then um, the randomness would be fine. Of course, you cannot take floating points. You will work on finite fields. I will not go into detail. But with finite field elements here, with a large field size, you have a large granularity. So the code is really good, right? So using now random um, is something like this. Instead of understanding what I should code here, you just give out linear equations. Yeah? You have A and B, and then you say 3A plus 5B, and you forward it whenever you can. But if you, do, you see two people coming in, then you just make a new function. You can recode. So something new, a recoder. right? And now if I, I discuss with you SDN and FV, the SDN has a centralized view on your network. You can place an NFV component that is doing the recoder exactly at this point. And you can place decoders over here, right, if you want, or an encoder over here. With SDN also here, you could say now what they should do, right? That is quite interesting. So dedicated uh, codes instead of random codes could work. But I will tell you, oops. So um, the other thing that network coding does is if you have a very simple, and this is the most simple example I could find, it's you have an encoder and a decoder and here a repeater. And this epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are the erasure rates. If you do an encoder and decoder here and you take any of the codes, what you will see is that the capacity of this network is given by a combination of both loss rates. I think that is reasonable, right? But network coding, when it came out 2000, said if you deploy network coding, of course in the right way, 
it will always give you the min cut max flow capacity of a network. So what is the min cut max flow of this network? So if you now say, I do now, instead of these coders, I name the RNC encoder here, RNC decoder here, and instead of a repeater, I take a, a recoder, sometimes it does too, doesn't matter. So um, what you see then here is the capacity is now the minimum of one minus epsilon one or one minus epsilon two. So if you have 60% losses here and 40% losses here, the capacity is 40%, and not a combination what would be 25%. Uh -huh. How does it work? That you have to look up a little bit, right? And we have a lot of nice examples where you can test it out, but it shows this is the min cut of this simple network. Awesome, right? So here's another example, and you can even uh, train yourself. Here you have a source with 64 packets. Here you have a destination that would like to receive the 64 packets. And here you have loss rates, 40%, 80%, 60%. Normal Wi-Fi loss rates if you switch off the uh, uh, retransmit uh, transmissions of the system. Now, if you send out the 64 packets from the source, the medium access strategy is around Robin. So the source sends one. With 20%, the destination will get it. Then the repeater one or the repeater two will get one chance to transmit whatever they got, and then it continues like this. If you have a recoder, um, it will be the same. The source sends, then the recoder will recode packets and send something out. And this is the, um, the curve of how many packets has the source to press into the network until the destination will say, I can um, solve that, or I can decode this. So it's, this is an uh, inverse commutative density function. If you have around 100 transmission from the source, this means here we have the repeaters. Repeaters mean whatever I get, I will throw out. The recoder seems to be way better, right? There are two different curves, it has to do with the field size, don't care about that. But you get a little bit better, or a little bit, fairly better, when you have the, um, the chance of recoding. But have in mind, the best thing that could happen is 64, right? Because you have to send 64 time slots. That would be if this link would be 100% perfect. Now, 76 sounds quite good, but you can go down to 64.3. So why is this possible? If you look at this network and you do the min cut, you see here is 20% capacity. Here you lose 40%, um, then 60%. As I said before, the min cut of this link is 40%. 40% 40 plus 40 plus 20 is 100%. The link is optimal. So if the recoders just do something, then you will find out, ah, they are recoding. You just have to play with the protocols. The way here the protocol was, whenever you have something, send something out. But if they wait a little bit to create more knowledge, then they will recode over larger base, and then you go down to 64.3. And why is there still something missing? This depends on the field size, and where we have linear dependency created by the code. Now, the nice thing is the recoding here is totally distributed. Right? It has to be so fast that you don't have to organize it with the SDN controller. It can go automatically. Good. And um, that I will not tell you what, what we think about. The, last, the, the next thing about the code is not only that it's very good for dealing with these adaptive changes in the network to get the resilience in the network, it also can help you to deal with latency. So as we have the random matrix, Nobody forbids you to play around with this matrix and add some zeros and give a structure into that. You still use random coefficients, but you make a structure into that. That is called sliding window encoding. Um, I hope that I have, here you see something what normally happens. When you have a picture and you go line by line and we code that, you see here the picture trying to decode it. Of course, you don't have enough information. Here you see the decoding matrix. The black ones are the zeros. This is the one. He want, tries to get the pivot elements. And after you have enough linear equation, poof, you get the picture, right? What, the, what you also could do is to say, hey, this was my matrix. And I do a corridor, something like this. And here, some zeros. And with this corridor, I could deal with the latency. That takes a while to explain it. But in a nutshell, if I send only packet number one to you and you receive it, you will say, oh, I have it. The next time I will put in packet one and two and I send it to you. And you can decode it because you had already one and you get two out of it. And then one, point two, one, two, and three. And every time I do this, you can instantaneously decode the packet. Problem, 
once you don't get a packet, you are losing this continuity to uh, decode. So to, all, to get this one, it's not just a corridor. Right? You can make it blind corridor and white, then you have a certain latency, the width of your corridor, or you adapt it with feedback. But then the corridor will have a certain shape. I hope that I got you one picture of it. Here you see that. Here we get the encoder matrix where you put some elements and sometimes it gets bigger, then it gets narrower, and you see what happens with the picture. Instead of getting the picture in the end, you get always something, um, again, um, ah, it comes again, with a different field size now. You see that until here it's okay, and then he's doing something, that he tries to solve something, it has to do with feedback to get the right amount of coded packets, and then you have something. So suddenly you have a code that deals with resilience and latency. And if you remember what we had there, the others were all on the line, the trade-off, and we can go to the upper corner. That's how we do it. Okay, coming to that. Who knows who this is? That's us engineers, right? I tell this to my students. We are all heroes, and we are going for the golden ring. And now tell me what is written in the golden ring. <coughs> Very good but in our ring, one code to rule them all. So I have now a code for the network. There are some people having a code for the source and people having a code for the physical air. Why do we have all the different codes? Why not one code? I heard one um, talk of Messi 20 years ago. He said it's a bad idea to put everything into one basket. But I heard also professors telling me that a random code is a bad code. So things change with time. Okay, I give you one example why this could be a good idea. I will bring together source coding and network coding. Not all together because in the keynote I cannot do this. Um, I don't know if you have heard about compressed sensing. Compressed sensing said, okay, nucleus criterium, fuck you. Okay, we don't believe that we need this bandwidth. If we know that the source is sparse, we can do some tricks. So you don't need to give twice the um, sampling frequency and this one. You can also do something tricky here. I put your network coding here. It was a linear superposition. It works with random coefficient. It was source agnostic. And when, once you have enough linear equations, you can decode, okay? Compressed sensing, at the same time people came up with the idea, and for me it was too complicated because they said I have a linear superposition. What intrigues me was they said we do also do random. Random seems to be a good idea these days. So they do random sampling, random sampling of pixels in a picture, totally weirdo. But they are aware of the source, and if there is some sparsity, even it's already there, or they can produce it with some optimization thing, L1, L2, whatever, they can solve the thing. So they are also using linear equation. So that intrigued me. Also. Can we bring this together somehow? Okay. In a nutshell, think about you have eight cameras here, and the eight cameras are, sending, are connected to a, a com communication node and the nodes are will just blasting it out. And they are get, everybody gets something from these and the next level will also blast it until you come to the sync. Now, this is something that Bosch is doing with audio. And with some sensors, we wanted to do it with cameras. We go back to audio, it's easier. Right? So nevertheless, imagine that you see always the same picture. Then you would understand Sleepy and wolf wise, say, I don't need to send all the information. One can send the information, the rest shuts up. But then you have to know what the others see. But if you always see a little bit different, so what is the difference that the delta that you have to send? Also, this is difficult to send. Now, assume that they produce these linear equations and we are sending the linear equations to the sink. And imagine that on the way, we are using the idea of recoding and we can adaptively compress the equation towards the sink. So if you have one megabit here at the camera, I don't, normally if you would just blast it here, it would be more than 16 gigabit, uh, megabit. But if you do it in a clever way, something between one and two, that would be something that I would like, see as a success that arrives at the sink. So um, coming back to this decoding, that was the very first decoded picture that we had. Of course, we took Lena. That was on the Nokia Symbian phone, and we just did network coding, right? And what happens is we saw that we could see Lena before we had the full information. And we never understood why this happened. And it only happened for a certain um, field size was the binary. And there was no sparsity in this picture, not at all. But the sparsity was in our code. 
So there was something of compressed sensing already inherently of what we did before. So this is what you, you see. You get some information. Black and white means uh, the encoder only spits out zeros and one binary code. And you see that it's Lena. The security guys would, would say it's not good. But if we change now the little bit, the, um, the coding coefficients, something like this happens. You get right away the picture. That's very good for cars understanding, should I go to the left or to the right? So making object detection on blurry things is not so easy, but we are working on that. Now, here is something where we have compressed sensing um, in a real network. So you have some sensors, and some sensors become cluster head. There are some uh, sensors sent to the cluster head. The cluster head will just broadcast. Whatever they receive, they will forward to the sink. It's a well-known uh, network from, this, um, from the textbook. And if you understand the sparsity of the signals that they hear or see, then you see the remaining data in a normalized way. Now, if we put in network coding, we would reduce the duplication that we caused by our broadcasting. So 25% we can save there. If we just switch on the compressed sensing, you see this curve where we get even more reduction. And you see also dependent on the sparsity, so how uh, correlated are the signals. Now, it depends now. You cannot say network coding is not performing as good as compressed sensing. The, how much you save with network coding depends on the size of the network. Right? We had a small network, and I will tell you even why in a minute. So what happens if we bring these two together? Then something like this happens. You make it a little bit better, only a little bit. So compressed sensing did the, the great job in the beginning, and then and there are not so many duplicates because we are not sending out. And after we're sending out more information, then re, uh, the network coding helps. But this is agnostic. Agnostic means we do network coding on the side and compressed sensing on one side. It's not a combined code. If we combine it, then this happens. We only need 10% of the information now. So what we did there is we wanted to combine the two things. What I did not tell you is to combine them, they need to work on the same field. Network coding works on a um, finite field and compressed sensing on a real field. So what we did is we brought network coding to the real field. When you do this, the problem is the recoder will make pro problems and cause some um, rounding errors. Therefore, we, the network cannot be so big. Nowadays, we go back. We say network coding, finite field, and the compressed sensing should also work. That's a little bit of work. But once you have these two things working together, I think we can even bring down the curve a little bit more. Plus, then we have the chance to work on latency. Here we just work on the, on the other stuff. So one example how we can bring source coding and network coding together. And currently, with um, Muriel from MIT, we also try to get the physical layer into that. So then we have one code that you can store. You take one big chunk. You chop it off. You can use it for IP packets. When it comes to your exit point, you chop it off in smaller things and use it as a physical code. Right? Then you don't have transcoding delays. Sounds dangerous in one way, but this is currently what we do, our research. OK, last but not least, two slides. I see you really want to kill me in the back. <laughs> I come back to my expert, right? And I come back, how can we teach this over the 5G um, network, right? There are some ex uh, things in it. And it's not only 5G. When I talk about um, 5G, I don't talk about 3GPP only. I also talk about the big work that's done in ITF that 3GPP later will steal over, right, what they need. So, um, if you see now, we want to bring our, our skills over there, right? We have three skills. OK, we do network slicing. One for audio, one for video, one for, for tactile haptic. Then when you have network slicing, we will need for this SDN, NFV, and ICN as building components. In order to bring the virtual, the digital twin, in order to train it locally, I need a mobile edge cloud. Or if I want to bring myself to the other side, I also need a mobile edge cloud holding my model, right? And of course, machine learning for the training, new air interface, et cetera. So all the bullets that you have seen in the 5G atom will be used also within the tactile internet. So we are standing on really good shoulders, on giant's shoulders, where we can use most of the stuff. And there's nothing what we really are waiting for with this showstopper. In the tactile internet, what we do there is mostly now to focus on how do we build the jackets? How do we compress the data? These things. This is more important because the rest will come as you have seen here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I
I wish we had more time to get more exciting ideas and learn about so many different things that you put together so nicely to, to give us uh, the big picture. Yeah. So maybe just one question or a couple of questions, quick ones. and. Uh, So thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, so there are a lot of oh, quite complicated, complicated techniques that all come into these networks, and we need them to have this better delays and so on. Do you think these networks will still stay manageable? Because at the end, if I think, for example, of German Telecom and so on, this network is huge. And we worked a bit with them, and they have always a concern, how can we keep the network manageable? And so this aspect, because if you put in there network coding and sampling and, and all the stuff, this will be you know, even more complex for them. Yeah. Um, I think that if we talk about one millisecond um, requirements, there will not be humans optimizing the network. So it will be some optimization, self-optimization, learning of the network. Um, the operators, they are used to manual tuning, especially their, their cellular systems. So if somebody would complain, they would go there and put a little bit more power on that until nobody's complaining for a while. So this is out of the question right now. So they need tools to manage their networks. That's for sure. And they have to build them or to buy them or um, have requirements on them. There are already people working on that. Um, I know a lot of people working on SDN and machine learning for that. Um, placement, uh, placement of recoders, that's what we do. Uh, so we would bring this also as a nice idea with understanding the topology, we're replacing re, um, recoders. That is something we would come up with if you bring in the technology. But in a nutshell, there's so many things that has to be managed. ICN networks, if you don't even know where the content is, um, you need a lot of more logics. I think that is um, one of the things that will come up. The way to, to establish recorders somewhere and application-specific recorders somewhere, it could also be part of the quality of service negotiation, right? Yeah. When you see you have to source through the network, you could also have this at the same time in there. I don't know how you calculate the jitter and everything else yeah. in between, but probably this would be a way to get these two issues, manageability and other yeah. things under one hood. Yeah. I think that's a nice question. So. Um, one of the tasks in the exercise for the students in the, for network coding is always we give them a network and say, where do you place the recorder if you have only one, right? Because that shows you a little bit that you need different types of questions. It's not only quality of service. Do you have the computing? And one of the things um, on the slides, you can see it a little bit, is when we do coding, and coding, for example, we would always like to go for a high field. So a mobile phone could do 2 to the 8, 2 to the 60, no problem. A cloud could do two to the eight, but a switch cannot recode at two to the eight, right? Because it has millions of streams. So he would like to to recode on other. So we have to understand what is, what is possible with you right now, right? What is your computing skill? Because latency and computing is not solved. So I cannot say do this task in, right? So therefore, um, you have to. Their learning is not bad. You try to find out. What kind of recorder did you place where, with which setting to get this kind of quality of service? Could you keep it? Yes or no? And then you will change it a little bit. But there's some work to do in this field as well. Because currently, we, we just look at one stream at very simplified networks. And once you have a huge network, it will be different. I had one last question. Uh, it's very nice to play tricks in the, uh, in, uh, in the network and uh, play with um, compressive sensing and uh, network coding in order, in order to exploit the bandwidth in a more intelligent manner. But isn't that some kind of orthogonal with the idea of using AI inside the network to understand the data? Correct. Um, that's a good question. So um, for me, there are two things. AI is a nice tool that can help us for certain things, and it's object detection. Great, right? I don't want to do anything else than machine learning. Uh, it more or less, is machine learning AI, right? So then people throw machine learning on everything, right? Um, but smart people come up with an algorithm that works. If you have an algorithm, you don't need the rest. Machine learning is good to understand it and maybe to look at the solution they came up with, and maybe you can get something better. And I strongly believe that in the end, we'll find out in these fields, machine learning will work, 
and here our thing will still work. For example, haptic codes, right? Um, Eckhard Steinbach is working on a code as we would do in the video code, very deterministic. You do this and this and that. People look also machine learning now, right? I would say compressed sensing is okay. We have five fingers, and there somehow this thing is sparse. Information. Well, this information. So um, let's see who, who will win the game, right? Maybe they combine them in a way. Um, I'm looking pretty much forward to this time where we have all these nice tools, but um, AI will not take over, right? The smart things not coming from AI, the smart things are somewhere else. Okay. Thank you so much for your talk.